Oklahoma's budget crisis is over, or is it? Allegations of underage seduction not in Alabama, but here. And a giant pipeline has a giant leak. This is OU Nightly. Finally, after weeks of legislative gridlock, Oklahoma's lawmakers have passed an emergency funding bill that will keep the lights on in all state agencies, but force another round of drastic cutbacks to essential state services. Now the governor must decide whether she will sign the bill. OU Knightley's Will Cornelius is at the Capitol this afternoon with more on lawmakers' solution to the budget shortfall. That's right. Just hours ago, senators passed a budget bill for the state of Oklahoma. This comes eight weeks into the special session where two other bills fell on the Senate floor and debate continued up until the final hour. Now we're just held hostage and we have to do what we're told. I'm not a been being held hostage kind of person. Over the past two months, legislators looked for a solution to the state's $215 million budget hole after the Oklahoma Supreme Court deemed Senate Bill 845 unconstitutional. Senators felt the battle had come to a head and realized, though it was not perfect, a budget bill was needed. This battle is at a stalemate, and we need to regroup and come back to fight again, and that's what I'm asking you to do. House Bill 1019, also known as the Cash and Cuts Bill, would take $23 million from the state's rainy day fund and carryover cash and $60 million in cuts from state agencies. These state agencies will face between four to $15 million in budget cuts. I can justify all the votes, and I'm going to justify this one today, because even though nothing's easy about this vote, there is no choice. Health Department doesn't make payroll if we don't pass this bill today. Though lawmakers do not agree on all parts of the bill, House Bill 1019 have received 29 ayes and 14 nays. I dare claim to have passed. Now, some are saying that this bill is merely a bandage for the state's overall budget crisis, but it will hold Oklahoma over until February of next year, whenever the legislature reconvenes. Hopefully there, they will find long-term solutions for the state's budget crisis. That's it for now. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Will. That bill now goes to Mary Fallon's desk for her approval. Follow us on Twitter at OU Nightly for continued coverage of the state's budget crisis. Legislators didn't give much comment as they exited the vote this morning. Many are disappointed in the lack of new money created. But Senate Leader Mike Schultz did release a statement. This is certainly not how the Senate wanted to resolve the budget shortfall, but it's the best option left to avoid devastating cuts. The Senate took extraordinary steps to advance a bipartisan revenue package, but that revenue deal didn't advance in the House. The Senate will, will continue its work to find reasonable and sustainable streams of revenue. And with proposed cuts all across the state, the legislature is getting some cuts too. Yesterday, a nine-member legislation board approved a salary reduction for Oklahoma legislators. Lawmakers' base pay will see an 8.8% cut effective next November. The additional pay for both House and Senate leadership positions will also face reductions. Canadian County Sheriff's deputies arrested 22-year-old Yukon High, High School teacher Hunter Day on sex charges involving a 16-year-old boy. Police found evidence of the relationship on the student's cell phone. Officers entered her home to find Day on the living room floor with the lights off and candles lit. Day admitted to sending pics in her undergarments. She, she's facing second-degree rape, facilitating se sexual contact with a minor and possession of child pornography charges. Day's husband is a football coach at the high school. School. She was booked into the county jail with her bond set at $85,000. And on a warmer note, we got a bit of a break from those chilly temperatures. Sawyer is here with more. Yeah, so uh, we really did get a break today. We've been in the lower 80s across some of the state, even some 90s in southwestern Oklahoma. Uh, off to the east, though, we do have some high clouds, or some thick clouds, excuse me, high clouds over our area as these start to move on out. You can see, though, it looks like the clouds start to disappear, and that's not because uh, they're actually disappearing. It's because we're getting darker, so... Uh, earlier during the time. So uh, as we go into our current temperatures right now, though, 81 degrees here in Norman. Oklahoma City actually set a record earlier today with 81. And there's some 90s, like I said, down near the Altus area. So overall, 
It's been a really dry and a really nice day, uh, really abnormal for this time of year though, but that's going to change as we do have a cold front moving in. We're going to start to return back to those normal conditions and a game day forecast all coming up in just a little bit. Until then, back to you. Thank you, Sawyer. Still ahead on OU Nightly, a former mayor and bank vice president is charged with over 30 felonies. Plus, the fate of other pipeline projects could be put in jeopardy after, after a Keystone pipeline spill. Welcome back to OU Nightly. I'm Caitlin Howard in the News Center. Crews shut down the Keystone Pipeline in South Dakota yesterday after a total of 210,000 gallons of oil leaked. The leak, the biggest Keystone oil spill to date in South Dakota, was stopped within 15 minutes. The company TransCanada said there are no further known environmental impacts and no threats to public safety. The leak comes days before Nebraska officials will announce whether the proposed sister project, the Keystone XL Pipeline, can move forward. The wife of Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore says her husband won't quit the race amid sexual assault allegations involving young women. Ignored pressure from Republican official, officials, including Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Senator Ted Cruz, President Donald Trump said allegations against Moore are troubling, but that the voters of Alabama should decide Moore's fate. Alabama Democratic Senate, Senate candidate Doug Jones has gained a lead in the polls since the sexual assault allegations surfaced. Reverend Jesse Jackson disclosed he has been seeking outpatient care for Parkinson's disease for two years and plans to dedicate himself to therapy. The 76-year-old said his family and friends noticed a change in him about three years ago and that he could no longer ignore the symptoms of the incurable neurological disorder. The civil rights icon and two-time Democratic presidential candidate plans to use his voice to find a cure for the disease. And Nicole OU's Iranian Student Association will hold a candlelight vigil at 7 tonight on the South Oval to honor the lives lost in the Iran-Iraq earthquake. Thank you, Caitlin. Yesterday, a former correctional officer pleaded guilty to using unnecessary force on an inmate. The 2014 incident included 41-year-old Jason Barber hitting Lloyd Wine Tillman during a disciplinary hearing. Prosecutors classified the incident as a misdemeanor and expect a probation sentence. A former Enid mayor and bank vice president faces fraud charges. Ernie Leroy Courier was charged yesterday with 33 felonies, including misapplication of funds, unlawful proceeds, false personation, and forgery. Police say with, that within the last 17 years, Courier opened more than 60 fraudulent fro loans and more than $6 million. If found guilty, Courier faces up to 299 years imprisonment and fines of over $150,000. Still ahead on OU Nightly, millions spent on a single painting. And Sawyer has more with the weather. Yeah, guys, we had a nice warm up today, but that's all coming to an end. I'll have the details right after this. And welcome back to OU Nightly. We're looking live at downtown Norman right now. And you see some of those clouds we've had, and it's been a really nice day outside, really abnormally warm for this time of year. We're at sitting at 80 degrees right now. Those south-southwest winds are blowing really, uh, really hard, 17 miles per hour right now. They're gusting at times up to 30, and that dew point's low, so the humidity is low, so it feels really nice. It's not uh, muggy. Current temps across the entire U.S., though, you can see where that kind of line is from about Kansas City on down to the southwest where you have those abnormally warm temperatures for this time of year. But a cold front is on the way, and I'll be moving through tomorrow early morning and uh, really dropping our temperatures, but even still, 24-hour temperature change, we're in the 20s, so 20 degrees above what we were yesterday at this time. Really abnormal, but really nice, too. Uh, low tonight, though, as that cold front starts to move through, we're going to get those winds to shift out of the north. Being gusty at times still, the, the speeds are at uh, gusts at times still up to upwards of 30. So 51 here in Norman and Oklahoma City. We've got some uh, 54 down in Lawton and then 40s and 30s back on to the north and west. And then your highs for tomorrow, not going to move and go anywhere anytime soon. We're sitting in the upper 50s, maybe some 60s down near the Red River. All right, so let's look at this. Here's our cold front at 2 a.m. We're going to start to move this through about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And you see a couple of showers that form. Uh, I would kind of discard those. I, I don't believe we're going to get any showers. We, there's a, maybe a slight chance. I put it like a 5 or 10% chance up to the northwest. But those winds are going to be screaming from the north. 
And then uh, as that moves on out, though, it's going to really cause some havoc up in the northeast, up near uh, Buffalo and Washington. They're expecting some snow up in those resorts. And then behind it, we get these high pressures built in, some really gusty southerly winds on Monday, bringing those, uh, they're not really going to bring us warm temperatures, but just gusty. So cooler temperatures on Saturday, those gusty winds, though. And now Sunday, still average temps and calmer winds, though. We'll shift to out of the southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Upper 50s Saturday and Sunday. Going to try to get in your freezing Saturday night, so we'll have to watch out for that. 39 for a low on Sunday night, and we're going to stay really in the upper 50s to 60s. Uh, throughout the entire Sunday, we get, do get a little bit of a cold front on Tuesday. And those winds will start to die down Monday. They're going to be at times gusty, but still, um, that's more normal for this time of year. Today's really just kind of weird overall in the sense of... Um, so southerly winds bringing some warm temperatures back to our area. Yeah, no kidding. It's been hot and cold, <laughs> hot and cold again. Can't so. decide. Yeah, we'll look out for the next seven days, and afterwards uh, we'll see what happens. Great. Thank you Perfect. so much, Sawyer. Thank you. And a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat sold at auction in New York last night for nearly $11 million. The painting Cabra was inspired by Muhammad Ali's 1970 knockout of an Argentine heavyweight, Oscar Bonavena. It was owned by Yoko Ono and part of the proceeds will go to the Spirit Foundations, founded by Ono and her late husband, John Lennon. The title Cabra is Spanish for goat. It's an acronym for the greatest of all time, a reference to Ali. The anonymous buyer got a bargain compared to the Wednesday night art, art auction in that auction, another anonymous buyer paid $450 million for Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci. That's the highest price ever paid for a single work of art. But it is one of only 16 known paintings by the master and the only one in private ownership. I'm sorry, did I hear that price right? That yeah. is definitely a pricey piece of painting. Very, 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 very expensive. But yeah. it's really cool that it's the only one in private ownership and it's exactly. not hung up at a museum. So that's kind of one of a kind. Interesting. <laughs> And All that's right. it for news this Friday night, but don't leave just yet. Big Friday Sports is on deck. Our sports team gives you an extended look at what's happening in sports. Madeline Roberts is here with more. Thanks, guys. Today on Big Friday Sports, we'll talk about the many Sooner athletes here on campus who have the same name. But first, we'll preview tomorrow afternoon's game, OU versus the Kansas Jayhawks. Big Friday Sports is next. Hello and welcome to Big Friday Sports. I'm Kyle Payne. And I'm Madeline Roberts. After a huge win last week against TCU, the Sooners head up to Lawrence to take on the Jayhawks. Game day use Carson Williams and Reagan Ledbetter are in Lawrence and are breaking down tomorrow's game for us. Thanks, guys. We are here in Lawrence ahead of OU's matchup against Kansas on Saturday tomorrow. OU 9-1. Reagan, Kansas comes in 1-9, and nine, kind of a story of polar opposites. It really is. OU coming off that big win at home against TCU last week, now plays Kansas before wrapping up their season next week at home against a pretty good West Virginia team. Yeah, I think so. OU talked about this week, obviously, you know, Kansas not up to, you know, Big 12 standards as far as winning or offense or anything like that, but they still believe that they can't take the Jayhawks lightly, and here's what they had to say about that this week. Uh, we haven't won the Big 12 yet, and they're another Big 12 opponent that's uh, in the way of our, our goal. So, I mean, it shouldn't take any extra motivation. Uh, we, we have to have the same mindset no matter who we're playing. And that's, that's kind of been our focus all year. It doesn't matter who we're playing. We have, to, we have to rise to the occasion and play well week in and week out. A win is a win in the Big 12, especially on the road. Reagan, looking ahead to tomorrow, what are your keys to the game? For me, it has to just be getting multiple guys involved. You know, Roddy Anderson had that big game yeah. last week. Some guys like that. You know, C.D. Lamb's been having some big weeks. But in a game like this, you know, playing a 1-9 Kansas team, you got to stay focused. you got to stay focused on the goal at hand. And that's, and that's, and that's next week. That's the week after. That's going to the college football playoff. Getting in those guys in, involved, get their confidence up. Abdul Adams, who's kind of had some off weeks. Trey Sermon. Yeah, who I haven't seen him in a while. Very, haven't, hasn't played very much. This is a week to get those guys in the ball game. And then the big one, avoiding injuries. I think this is a game that they take Baker Mayfield out early if yeah. they're you know up by quite a bit. You kind of have to. I mean, you, you can't really run the risk of getting any of your top players hurt in a game like this. Yeah. Not to not to not discredit Kansas at all. They're still they're still a good football team, one of the best defensive lines in the nation. Yeah. This OU OU team is very high on their defensive line, but still, you want to avoid injuries in a game like this. Yeah, I think so. Two years ago, whenever OU rolled into Lawrence, I don't think Baker Mayfield played at all in the second half. But for me, I think kind of going off of what you know you touched on, my big key to the game is just sticking to what you know. Get in here, get your win, and get out 
because that puts you just a one win closer to the Big 12 title game, almost locks you up. Um, I would think, in a sense, uh, kind of depending on what other teams do. Well, that'll do it for us here. Guys, back to you in the studio. Kyle, what's your score prediction for the game? I think OU will get the best it can get from Kansas tomorrow, but that just won't be enough to flood on the best offense in the country. Sooners win easy, 52-13. Should definitely be the e Sooners' easiest test in the Big 12 play so far. Kansas hasn't won a conference game since last November when they beat Texas. <laughs> I'm taking OU 48-10. And after a huge week in college football last weekend, this one's looking a little more relaxed when it comes to the top five. Number one, Alabama welcomes Mercer at 11 a.m. The number two, Clemson Tigers welcome in-state rivals the Citadel Bulldogs. Number three, Miami welcomes the six and four, Virginia, to the Hard Rock Stadium. And number five, Wisconsin welcomes the number 19 ranked Michigan Wolverines. And still to come on Big Friday Sports, we'll recap last night's Thursday night football game. And we'll preview the OKC Thunder's big game tonight. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to Big Friday Sports. Now the all-important game day forecast for up in Lawrence. Lower 50s, mostly sunny skies though, but unfortunately those winds, northwest 20 to 25 miles per hour. So guys, I would not be one of the kickers in this situation. So take it away. Thanks, Sawyer. This is the year of the tray at OU. Four freshmen are taking on huge roles in both football and basketball, and Josh Calloway shows the impact they continue to make. Four trays, four rising stars. Trey Sermon in the backfield, Trey's Norwood and Brown in the secondary, and Trey Young on the hardwood have all made their statements that the futures of OU basketball and football are certainly in good hands. They, they make competitive plays on the ball, and, and they really, probably the thing I was most proud of is they, is they tackle well. You know, they had both had some big open field tackles. You know, Trey Brown makes the tackle um, when they break one on the, uh, on the series where they ended up missing the field goal, you know, that if he doesn't make that tackle, they probably score on that play, and you know, the you know the momentum of the game is a little bit different. Uh, Trey's done an amazing job, you know, being a true freshman out here on the on the field, you know, running touchdowns, making blocks, doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's he's been doing a great job. Jordan Shepard up high gives the young long three. That's good. Meanwhile, Trey Young is the highest touted basketball recruit Oklahoma has had in years, and in his first two games, he is just averaging 18.5 points per game and 11.5 assists. It's wicked. It's fun uh, with, with a guy like Trey. Uh, he's going to push the ball, uh, and so really just run with him. Find a lane, find a spot, give, give him a little area that's between you and your defender so he can get the ball through there. I mean, and just wait. And just do your job. He's going to do his. So, I mean, it's exciting to play with Trey, especially at the, at the breakneck speed that, that we're moving right now. Oklahoma fans are quickly realizing just how much of a treat it is to watch these trays. Josh Calloway, Big Friday Sports. And the OKC Thunder are in San Antonio tonight to take on the Spurs at 7. The Thunder are set at 7-7 seven and seven on the season and are riding a three-game win streak. Thunder center Steven Adams is back in the lineup after missing the past three games with a right calf contusion. But the Spurs are still without starters Kawhi Leonard and Tony Parker, who have been in injured since before the season began. And last night, Brad Stevens provided a game plan to hold the Warriors to a season-low 88 points and come out with a win, their 14th straight. The Warriors led by as many as 17, but Kyrie Irving and Jalen Brown provided enough scoring to come back and to seal the win. The Splash Brothers struggled from the field, only connecting on 5 of 20 from 3 combined. The Celtics now have a commanding lead on the best record at 14 and 2. Also last night in Pittsburgh, the Steelers improved to 8 and 2 on the season as they demolished the Titans 40 to 17. Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger threw for 299 yards and 4 touchdowns. For the Titans, Marcus Mariota threw for 306 yards and a touchdown, but had four interceptions, leading to the Titans' four-game winning streak to come to an end. In the MLB, most valuable players were announced last night, and Jose Altuve took home the AL crown. After leading the AL in hits, batting average, and taking home the 2017 World Series, the MVP seemed like a lock already. Rookie sensation Aaron Judge finished second, followed by Jose Ramirez in third. In the National League, Giancarlo Stanton of the Miami Marlins took home the MVP trophy. Stanton led the league with 59 homers and 132 RBI. He's the first in Marlins history to take home the award. But the 28-year-old star is uncertain which team's roster he'll be on next season. Thanks for watching Big Friday Sports from the campus of the University of Oklahoma. We'll leave you with highlights from OU's huge win last week over TCU. Good night.
Second down. It wasn't about anybody else in the country. It was just about us. You know, we had a great challenge in front of us. TCU is a great, you know, great program. They have a great team.